Damn if we're live for me. We're live. <laughs> Guys, welcome to the very first live cut to. And we're on location. We're actually with a live guest really here. She's in person. This wonderful person sitting next to me with a very, very jazzy jacket is a creator herself, a science communicator, and works with creatives. So we've got some good questions lined up. She currently works for the Center for Virus Research here in Glasgow, part of the University of Glasgow. They've been doing some incredible work recently. It is Faye Watson. Thanks so much for joining us. Round of applause. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So that was a little intro from me. Yeah. Introduce yourself. Oh God. Tell us about yourself. Uh, so I'm Faye. Uh, c considering I'm holding a cider, I'm not an alcoholic. She's mentioned booze. All um, right, let's. let's <laughs> I, I was waiting, waiting as much as I could. Cheers, as long as you oh, <laughs> lively, lively, lively. I mean, this is this is live, isn't it? Yeah. It's good to do a cheers in mm. person. We normally cheers a camera. Gosh, yeah, yeah. Same, same. Really, <laughs> still, still taste. Actually, I'm on a different innocent gun, but that's another story. I thought we weren't doing product placement. Oh, absolutely. We're looking. We're, if you're looking to promote lager on this show, what camera I'm your are you guy. looking at? What camera are you on? I'm, I'm looking at the wide, but I've got no idea. Jake's well, not this keeping is the one on you. We've got no tally lights, people. We've got no tally lights. Just looking at you live. All right. Babe, Amateurs. Babe, babe, in, all introduce all yourself. Introduce yourself. This is probably the hardest question that I've ever been asked with all of these cameras pointing at me at once. So, wh which camera am I looking at? On the wide? Am I that? <laughs> you're, you're on this one. You're on this one. This one, the, the, the Lumix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Grand. No, 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 the other no, one, the, the black other magic. One. Yeah, yeah, she yeah. should not be talking to you or us. No, she wants to look down you the lens. You don't want to look down the lens. Down, down the camera. Your mum's, we know your mum's watching, so, yeah. She's in safe hands. So, you you work you work at the CVR, right? I do. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I'm, oh gosh, this, I don't know why I'm struggling with this no, so perfect, much. Babe. Yeah, so this is back great. to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is ridiculous. Okay, so <laughs> what do you want to know? Do you want to know my full life story, my no, my childhood a trauma? Short, short, short intro. So what do you do at the Centre right. for Virus Research? At the CVR. Yeah. Grant, I can do that. Um, so at the CVR, I run the um, Public Engagement and Communications um, Programme. Um, and this is a mix of things from our kind of communications, which everyone kind of knows about, which is kind of our marketing, um, who we are, what we do. Um, and then also our more kind of in-depth programmes, so the ones that we're working on you, with you guys on. Um, with the Terence Higgins Trust, this is working with people who actually live with the viruses that we um, investigate and research. Um, all the way through to working with communities and in places, for example, like Peru, um, with communities who are in, um, impacted by the viruses um, that we study. So, for example, anyone living near bats in Peru. Um, and things like that. So I basically manage the programme. Um, at the moment, we have a team of three plus me. Um, this is going to be going up to five, which is really exciting. So yeah, big changes, especially through COVID, working at a virus research centre. We've had a lot to do over the last couple of years. Um, yeah, really exciting. You've said the C word. Yeah, sorry. We, we promised we promise this show wouldn't be oh, about COVID. It's not. It's not. <laughs> it's not. It's not. No. Yeah, yeah. Mask, masks were removed in Scotland yesterday. Yep. Um, which is interesting. Interesting. But we're not talking about that. So in terms of you and your creative work at the CBR, how important is it for you to delve into your own background in terms of content and creativity and work with others internally and externally with science? Like you guys are communicating some pretty complicated and confused stuff. How important is the, the content and creative? so important um i think you know most of our kind of researchers um now especially in the last couple of years have been seeing that our audiences are literally everyone now and everyone takes in content completely differently you have people who want to read a book you'll have people who want to watch a video you'll have people who like want to have a look at photos and it's really important for us as kind of working as creatives to understand how people want to receive that information and then create like create that content in all different types to to send that out so that all people can have access to knowledge about viruses and the diseases that they cause nice because you you work with us as as content creators we create a lot of video content but recently you've also been working with an artist as well and lots of graphic work um so there's quite a mix for anyone interested in working with science and and creative work what advice would you give them? 
Um, just get in touch. I think a lot of easy. <laughs> it is, it, easy. It's one of those things, like especially well for my for my centre as well. Like we absolutely love hearing from creatives who who are just interested in what we do, mm. and a couple of the artists that we're now you know involved with, and especially later this year, I'm really hoping to launch a comic book. Um, is that this has come from illustrators and people, especially getting in touch with us and saying, hey, I really like this person's research or this is really interesting mm. to me. Are there any opportunities? Like I had another video company contact me this morning and I was like, sorry, we've, I've actually <laughs> I've <laughs> already got one. Good. But then I could like pass them on to other people I know mm. who are looking and, and things and there's loads of opportunities. So I think, yeah, especially within the, like the public engagement and kind of science communication communities, like so many of us are working with creatives all day, every day. And even if we can't take someone on, there'll be someone that we know that kind of will that will yeah. so that's kind of my biggest thing is like don't be scared to just reach out and especially the research community just love telling people about what they're doing and if there's someone who wants to do that in a creative way then they'll be more than happy to to think of a way that they can work together love it i, I like that you're also being um approached by other production companies we will find Sorry. you <laughs> and we will kill you. <laughs> no, like um, healthy competition only keeps us sharp. Um, <clears throat> just, just to bring it back. So your your um, role, correct me if I'm wrong. You're a science communicator, right? So how did how did you fall into that? How does how did you end up what you're doing just just now? Happy accident. Um, actually, I was doing a master's at Cardiff Uni in biology, um, where I was researching plants. Um, and I went to this random seminar um, run by the Royal Society of Biology, which was the importance of communicating science. And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting, something I like we should be doing. And I went and it was the head of um, education at one of our local science centres who did this amazing demonstration of like, making science simple. And I just came away from it like, that is what I want to do. And I didn't know it at the time that there was actually a career that you could do in it. So I did it as a volunteer and I set up like a volunteering group at Cardiff Uni. And that was a load of students who used to go to local science centres and things. And we, you know, we did little silly little like activities. Mm. Um, but then I just kind of, mm, but that, again, still didn't know that you could have a career in it. So I started a PhD. Um, which was completely the wrong decision. But alongside that, I was doing loads more engagement and like going to the local museum and things like that. And it wasn't until I got to the realization that I, research wasn't actually what I wanted to do that I started seeing jobs coming up that were kind of in actual like science communication um, and that you could actually get paid for it and it'd be a pretty like good career. Mm. Um, so yeah, I just quit my PhD, um, completely cold turkey, and then f luckily fell into a job in London. And how did you end up in Glasgow at the CVR? Um, oh, here's my sob story. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Completely it was joking. a dark, stormy night. <laughs> um, no, so I had this um, amazing job in London um, at the Wellcome Centre for Human Neuroimaging, um, where I was working on incredible projects where we were bringing neuroscientists together with artists and things. But it was an interim positions they only had um, a few months worth of funding mm. um, and I was like great end of that I want to go traveling I was like brilliant end of my contract perfect time to just sack everything off and go traveling so sold my house <laughs> quit why well, not quit but came down to my contract and that was in March 2020 Hmm. Um, and ha <laughs> no, <Yeah>. no. <laughs> and also not a good time to be going traveling. Um, no, not great. So sadly, those plans got put on hold and I just started looking for, for job roles in public engagement and saw this one come up and I thought there is no better time to do engagement at a virus research center. Um, and yeah, went for the interview. Did a, that was the kind of first foray into Zoom, did my interview on Zoom hmm. um, and yeah, got the job and here I am. And here we are. Is this a cut to moment, shall we? I think so. But before we before we do <laughs> cut to, I should have really like we'll have new audiences purely based on you, Faye. So thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, so cut to is it's a late show for creatives, and I'm sure we can all appreciate that creativity stretches into every part of life, uh, especially working life. So we like to catch up, grab a drink meet interesting new people and talk about creativity, work, and we'll delve into that. And we like to do a little thing just to, just to move it along because Martin and I chat quite a bit. Me more than him. He's the strong, silent type. I'm the smudgy kind of <laughs> chatterbox. So <laughs> That's a nice way to put it. I know. I, I'm, being, I'm being polite to myself there. Shall we cut to? Join us. You, don't, you will oh. need to cradle your drink. Cut to! Oh, 
Yeah. Now, that's, <laughs> that was the first cut to we've done in person, and like the thing is, we never get it in sync when we're doing it remotely, <laughs> and I've just fucked it completely. <laughs> So, can we do it again? We can, yeah, All yeah. Right. I mean, we'll we'll sync it. Uh, no, we <laughs> can't. This is live. All right, <laughs> cut to. Let's move along um, into specifically learning your craft. <clears throat> You've spoken a little bit about how you kind of ended up there, but how did you learn the craft of marrying that science stuff, right? Because you're educated. You've got a degree. But how did you? How did you learn? How did you learn to? take those really complicated science research elements that are going on out there and then pivot that into, hey, I can communicate that. How did you learn that? This is a difficult one because it was a, I just learned it. It was one of those things by just doing. So mm. I've always been, like, I'm like, yeah, I'm a chatterbox. I talk 24 seven and- <laughs> I, I know, <laughs> we've had some calls. <laughs> like our, our one hour that are meant to be one hour calls, <laughs> never our one hour. But it's just been something that I'm just so passionate and nerdy about science. Mm. And I've been, I'm really lucky that my mum was a neuroscientist. So I've grown up surrounded by it and talking wow. about it all the time. Mm. Um, and you know, when I was at school and stuff, again, I was part of, <laughs> so nerdy, but I was in like the science clubs and oh, all sorts of things. Right. Um, this is why I'm trying to like really overcompensate by thinking of like making everyone think I look cool. Um, <laughs> actually a massive nerd. Um, but yeah, it was just a case of like, just throwing myself into it. And then at uni, as I was saying, like with that volunteering group, it's just going out and doing it and teaching other people mm. and it's just something that's kind of come quite naturally but I really really enjoy helping people get that light bulb moment and you have to, and you can only do that by practicing and talking to lots of different people about it um, and I guess like through doing <laughs> degrees in science and having to do presentations and all of this like all of the time um, yeah it's just kind of by practice but would you say you're you're a natural communicator like as a as a natural skill you know within your family given that you're always talking about pretty complex subjects i can imagine you as a six-year-old neuroscience mom yeah yeah uh-huh something about the brain it would have been more complicated than that it's just that i know nothing about it this could be a whole other podcast <laughs> it was a pretty Faye good young neuroscience it was a good young fey voice though i thought you know yeah <laughs> a little more Portsmouth needed. Um. Okay. But like, do, would you say um, in terms of your confidence and your communication skills, is that something that you naturally had from a youngster and you kind of developed that and then kind of brought those science and content elements together? Because you've done photography in the past. Tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about that. Yeah. Um, so to answer your first question, absolutely. Like, yeah, in the family, the complete chatterbox, one mm -hmm. who doesn't shut up. Um, yeah. And then photography was, I was, gosh, 12, 13 years old. Um, my cousin is a um, event rider, so she does the kind of the comp competing on horses. Um, and my stepdad bought. He's one of those people that just doesn't matter what the what the situation is, he'll buy the t a tool for it. So he he was like, right, I'm going to buy the best camera I can find. Nice. And we started going to these events and supporting her because um, she was getting selected for the British teams. Mm. And I took his camera one day and just started snapping. And I was reasonably good. <laughs> the ti like timing and understanding. Full order, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, actually. <laughs> um, and composition wise and nice. things, I just had the eye for it. Mm. And, and, and a moving subject as well. Like, yeah. That ain't easy. No, so um, a couple of my photos got quite recognised. I ended up in some magazines on websites. Oh, nice. Um, some of the kind of Olympic team were asking... Big in equest in yeah. <laughs> Equestrian, is that the one? Yeah. Yep. Nice. Um, Just wanted to check. Yeah. Just wanted to check. Um, and yeah, when I was 15, I decided to do photography at GCSE. Um, and I, my like my family kind of clumped together and bought me my first DSLR, um, and from there I like started up Faye Watson Equestrian Photography FWEP, made my own logo. Good niche. Um, <laughs> yeah, and probably undercut all of the professional photographies, yeah. photographies, photographers that were on the circuit. Every photographer watching this is like, yep, yep. <laughs> been there, been there, done it. But I was a 15-year-old. Like, give me some slack. <laughs> Yeah, but you came across like a 25 year old. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> With your blazer, yeah, you, know. you know, walking in there. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Undercutting everyone. Yeah. Brutal. Good. Brutal. <laughs> Good business model for a 15 year old. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> living at home, yeah. supported by their parents, undercutting professionals. Um, that's like basically online these days, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I feel it. Yeah, I just like, I'm going to look down the camera and apologise to all of the photographers who I undercut with my five pound deal. A five pound deal? <laughs> so how much it was? Per well, foot so, or no, per no. day? So like, when I, if, <laughs> <laughs> no, so like, I, my dad bought me for Christmas like a pack of um, like CDs that I could like, you know, the burn old on. days burn yeah, yeah. on stuff. And the old I'd, days, I remember that. Like, <laughs> Yeah, he, um, doesn't, he doesn't let it show though. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd like go to these events and some of my friends would be there competing and I'd be like, chuck us a fiver and I'll give you a CD of all your photos. That's, that's and you know, I have like three or four friends that day and like for a 15 year old. Yeah. Yeah. That's that savvy. Was, yeah. Yeah. Job. yeah. Nice so that's kind of how, how it started. But then my dad bought a camera and got like really, really into, into photography. And he is a phenomenal photographer. Mm. Um, and I used to spend um, like my whole half terms with him. So he'd obviously be trying to find things to keep me entertained for a whole week. Um, and we'd just go out with our cameras. And that's what got me into landscape photography and wildlife photography. And we'd sit for hours in hides at the local wildlife centers and reserves and stuff. Um, and yeah, that was kind of the way that I used to bond, like spend time and bond with dad, was that we'd awesome. sit for hours. So now I have a really niche, weird knowledge for wetland birds um, <laughs> as well. Know. But <laughs> Come in handy. Yeah. You might need to communicate them one day. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty awesome. Nice. So would that have been your first paid gig? Yeah. Five pounds. Five pounds. <laughs> pretty, that's, I think that's the lowest yet. But cost of a CD, you know, so you had some... You know, you had some outfits. Overheads, yeah. yeah some overheads. <laughs> you grew into the jacket, though, which I like. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> Do you have any of your old CDs, your burnt CDs, anywhere? <laughs> Probably. Will nice. you sell us a, a copy? Yeah, oh, if you nice. want. Um, yeah. I've got them all backed up. Yeah. I'll send you some of my first works. That, that would, would be, be great. Awesome. <laughs> Could you, would you sign the, the yeah. cover? Nice. Absolutely. Nice. Well, we did share some of your photography work, and I must say it was really awesome. And that was all from, I think, the last year, actually, since I moved to Scotland, mm. most of that. I mean, and Scotland is one of the most beautiful countries in the world for, for content. Absolutely. I think two, two of them were from South Wales because I lived there for seven years. Um, and that's got some magnificent coastlines and, mm. and stuff as well. But yeah, most of that's Scotland since I've moved here. Mm. Well, we are based in Scotland, just so everyone knows. And uh, we put some real production value into this one because we brought the sun in, which is not <laughs> cheap in Scotland, no. as you can imagine. I, I can't believe it. We're stuck indoors again filming. <laughs> any any time. We should be outdoors right now. Next, next. Oh, we could do it in the centre of town. In we'll a beer a garden, too. I reckon. <laughs> beer garden. That does Bre make sense. The back of Brel. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. That would be nice. Nice Brel. If you want to. in touch. <laughs> Copperberg. <laughs> <laughs> you work with and manage people. Mm -hmm. Lois. <laughs> What's it like... Lois. What's it like managing people, Lois? What's it like? <laughs> it's great. Um, I'm really lucky that I, you know, I have Lois and Sam's just joined us as well, Sam Langford, um, as a project manager for our TIC project. Um, and I have two interns as well at the moment. And I'm really lucky that the kind of the people that are in my team completely complement my skill set. So we don't have a load of people who are all arguing with each other about the same things because we all, <laughs> I don't know what, I mean, Lois is a wizard, like, in what she can do in terms of graphics and you guys have seen it you know you're a wizard Lois <laughs> yeah we're waiting for it Lois <laughs> <laughs> don't I'm joking I'm joking I'm joking we're not waiting for it Lois so so um, have you actively hired people who aren't like you um I mean when when kind of last year came about when Lois joined us it was a case of um, I'd worked with her as an undergraduate student mm. and um, helped with her undergraduate project which is all about communicating about vaccines to help around vaccine hesitancy and she was using social media as a method of communicating about vaccines and seeing how um, kind of reliable that was and if it was a good platform for engagement and I just thought this this girl is great and I want her on my team. And luckily at the time, you know, we, we were in a position at the CVR where we had some money, you know, working with COVID and stuff in that I was able to hire her and just kind of be like, this girl is brilliant at what she does. She can do things that I, you know, I would take me two weeks to learn. She can do like that and just has the eye for graphics and design. And, you know, so since she's coming on board, our whole communications at the CVR has completely changed. And, you know, it's something it would have taken me a while to do. We had a communications consultant as well come in last year, uh, Lucy Wallace, who was absolutely fantastic. Com yeah, com yeah, you know, worked on 
several things with us and yeah I've, I've been lucky that and especially with the creatives as well being able to kind of employ people into the team who just have completely kind of completely different skill sets to me mm. um, and that's kind of where my role is now is that kind of sit, is overviewing this mm. and kind of helping everyone work together and the interns I have as well at the moment completely different skill sets to, to me and that's you know they've they've just applied I haven't chosen them but they're absolutely brilliant um, and I've got two more starting in September as well who are focusing on completely different things than we've had before so I'm um, yeah and Sam who's joining us for the TIC team he has the most incredible network of, across Scotland um, that I don't have having only moved here recently and you know as a science communicator as well and he's a science you know science presenter comedian so again completely different skill sets to me um yeah so yeah, yeah very lucky <laughs> how big's your team just now um so at the moment it I, is I, can, I think i can answer that because i was listening <laughs> oh sorry <laughs> well, my, my follow-up my follow-up was was uh, what's the diversity like um mm. in terms of the broadest sense of diversity yes not very oh really at the mo- well well <laughs> this is i'm sorry the cvr um so me lois sarah <laughs> at the moment are kind of all in our 20s um young women then we've got jamie who's just joined us um also in his 20s doing a phd but he came from industry um and sam as well from glasgow again um in his early 30s um but this is something that we're like really working on and a new project that i've got um is working with people in uganda Mm. um so we've got this whole new model of engagement where instead of kind of our public even though it's our researchers who are working out in uganda instead of me going over and managing the program we're going to be working with you know people like me science communicators in uganda Mm. who understand you know the kind of culture and the other considerations that we have to make in Uganda and they will be managing the project um, and as well with the tick project um, we understand you know with with ticks the biting arthropods um, people in the outer hebrides are the most at risk from these so so me and sam sitting in glasgow aren't the right people to be making the decisions yeah. on what we should be doing so that project we've built in working with communities and trying to increase the diversity of our teams to make sure that you know that everything is done f- by the you know, with the stakeholders that are involved at the at the heart of what we do, um, but this is something that we're yeah really and, and actually in the sector, the public engagement sector, this is something that we're really working on. Um, and with my old boss from um, UCL, Cassie Hugill, um, and Dan Taylor, who's now working at the British Heart Foundation, um, that is a complete lie. He's working for the British Red Cross. Why did the <laughs> British Heart Foundation come into my head? But anyway, there's. Um, developing a conference called the Next Steps Conference and this is all about inclusive practices in hiring into public engagement and how can we make our workforce in you know more more accessible mm. to people who are in these communities that we're trying to work with. Um, so that's a very good question. Huh. I'm glad I saved myself. <laughs> good question Martin, good question. Real, real quick question on to just to tie up learning. <clears throat> Firstly, do you need to have a science background to work in science communication? Absolutely not. And this is something with that conference as well that we're saying is that not everyone needs to have a science background, nor, you know, and I think at the moment the big question is, is do do people like me need to have a PhD? Do we need, and that's the main thing, is that the jobs like mine, you you didn't used to be able to get unless you had a PhD. Yeah. Because there was this understanding that to be able to communicate science, you needed to have done it. Yeah. At, but I, you know, I did half a PhD, I just quit it. I didn't want to do it. Yeah. And, and, you know, like people like Lois, she's got an undergraduate degree in immunology, again background in science but to, for what she does there's no need for that for you know she's absolutely brilliant in in she, you know she's got, got the grasp of of the understanding of the science but it's all in the creativity and again when we're working with our community members you know if we're working with people you know our com- if we had a community officer for example it would be more important to have someone from that community who understands the community the community yeah. you can teach the science you know and it's it's but it's all about especially as our approach is all stakeholder approach it's all person-led engagement is you need people from the groups that you're trying to communicate to to be working with you so that you can you know communicate in the best way possible nice. um and yeah and that's the thing that we're really trying to push at the moment in you know is that you don't you shouldn't need a degree you shouldn't need a phd to be able to access engagement in science communication just passion enthusiasm and yeah as i said you can learn the science Awesome. Yeah. So basically what you're saying is if you've got no skills, no qualifications, contact Bay because she's got work for you to do. <laughs> but I think a good example of this is Alex. Me. No, oh, good, <laughs> no good. but Alex, actually, well, okay. both yeah, of yeah. you. Let's no. make Alex the full guy. Yeah, no. yeah. Alice. Oh. God. 
Uh, what about Alex? <laughs> Everyone forgets about Alex. We don't talk about Alex. Um, no, Alice, the artist that's working on the yeah. Terence Higgins project, you know, Real she cool. is an absolutely incredible illustrator who has been working a lot with children. And like the, she illustrated a book about a little um, robot on Mars. And, you know, her background is in theatre and in teaching. But her, she's now got, even though she's working as the head, head of art at a school in London now, but on, for four days a week, but on her fifth day, she's still, she's working with my old centre in London, helping communicate about MRI machines to help our, some of their patient groups feel more comfortable getting into an MRI machine. Mm -hmm. So she's drawn these lovely illustrations and things, and now she's got this whole kind of side life as a scientific illustrator um, wow, and working awesome. with us on the Terence Higgins project she's done amazing illustrations of the journey of a blood sample into research working with people with HIV and hepatitis and she's actually for one of our researchers Adam Fletcher is going to be drawing illus illustrations of his team and this isn't necessarily just the people in in the lab it's the viruses that they research mm. <laughs> so she's going to be creating little you know Characters, little characters. Yeah. little characters, and it's just a way of making everything more accessible. What about some um, of the tools, like you know, some of the microscopes? Mm -hmm. That's one. Yeah. Uh, and pipetting. Yep. That's another. Um, there's one thing if you've ever worked in a lab. Can we get you doing something on camera? Something, something, and they'll go pipetting, <laughs> and we're like. Yep, know it well, know it well. <laughs> that's the one where you just, you're just you taking things out and putting it back in. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. Yeah, yeah, out yeah. of that's here and yeah. pushing yeah. it there. Yeah. Sook out of here, yeah, yeah, classic, yeah. classic. All right, final, final last question. What's the one thing that someone out there who might be watching, who's like, ah, science communication, that's pretty cool. They may be a creative, they, they don't want a full-time job in science communication, but what would help them be more kind of suitable to help a person like you or to move into a career within science communication? What should they be focused on? Um, okay. It's Not the science we've no, clarified. No. So is it the communication? <laughs> yeah, I think have a go at taking a news article. Start. Don't start with, you know, scientific papers because no one can digest those. Not even the scientists <laughs> that write them to be sorry. But <laughs> um, have a go and um, you know in my interview um i had to take a paper i had to take a paper and write a news article for the website of of that paper without mm. any understanding of the science and things you know kind of behind it i'd come from a neuroscience background so i didn't and that's the sort of thing to try is can and start with a news article or or mm. a pop you know kind of a popular article maybe from science mag or, or new scientist and try and dilute that down even further with a little bit of research because that's what you know what my, me and my team do is we have to go in with you know with a paper with minimal understanding of what it's about do a little bit of research and dilute that for the public mm. and that's it's a good yeah just find some articles draw some pictures or you know whatever medium you work in just see if you can make that more understandable and test it on family and friends you know the amount of times I've sent things to my mum dad stepdad sister <laughs> you know my sister's been a great consultant on our vaccine <laughs> stuff unpaid I pay her in love oh. um, and babysitting you can't buy clothes with love <laughs> that's how we can we kind of describe when we're chatting with contributors who haven't you know they're well scientists actually where they're trying to communicate some of their work and they have a they prepared a script the night before and they're trying to remember all the lines word for word and it never works so what we try to say is you know talk to us as if you're talking to your mum you know explain it that way just you know sim simplify it which is quite interesting because that seems to be what that is what you're doing yeah it's literally the whole bedrock of my job mm. is to is just to be like okay imagine you're like sat at home and you're chatting to your mum yeah how would you explain it and for creatives as well you know it's like, like alice when she we did they had this amazing paper on how the rhinovirus yeah. vaccine um vaccine virus um which causes the common cold in your um lung cells it basically protects you against covid so we had this whole mm. paper basically if you get a cold you're not going to get covid that was the the very wide thinking and Alice sat down and she did these incredible illustrations of of the the lungs and the lung cells and little rhinoviruses and little co like covid particles and that was probably one of the best received things we've ever put out on social media did they look like little rhinos <laughs> not quite am i the only one <laughs> no no jake but... little rhinos should the rhinovirus be illustrated with little rhinos 
<laughs> we've, we've got we've got two Jakes behind camera. Yeah, we've I'm got Jacob not. and Jake, or the Jakes, yeah. or the Jakeys, <laughs> if you're in Glasgow. <laughs> Which is a bit mean. <laughs> All right, well I'm I'm done with this one, and you're I'm nursing yours. Too much chat from this one. Too I'll much let you chat. go. That's all right. Just yeah. hitting the equipment. Cool. That's good. Cool. It can take it. It can take <laughs> okay. it. Okay. All right. Shall we shall cut we two? Cut, yeah. Oh. No, no, no. You drink. We'll cut two. <laughs> okay. <laughs> cut two. Well, I always say in terms of um, us communicating uh, the work that we do for clients, not just in science, but technology and really anything. Because if you speak to anyone who's knowledgeable about a subject, irrespective of how simple they can explain it, it's very complex and challenging. And I always say, I don't know much about this. So if you can explain it to me and I understand it, chances are everyone will. Um, not always though. Sometimes I just don't get it. I'm like, break it down for me further, a little bit more. But I think that's where like all of the training that we've done as well. And that's that's the thing that I, I, we've done so much training with both of you because I can't, necessarily because I'm in there now and I work with viruses every day and I'm talking to them about viruses every day I can't even necessarily see it sometimes mm. so that's why I think working with creatives and working from people who really are stepping into this for the complete first time is really really valuable and this is what I want to do with the comic book is I want to have a group of our researchers who are really keen to do comic books and then a group of illustrators and basically do like uh, speed dating where you have two minutes each. Yeah. The artist can explain their pro their process and their practice, and the researcher can explain their science. And at the you kind of you all meet each other, and at the end they rank who they'd like to work with and who kind of. But this is a it's you know so that in public engagement like that's the engagement. It's not the comic book that comes out at the end of it. It's the process of the of the creatives having to kind of again simplify their process and how they work to the researchers but also the researchers really for someone who's coming in completely cold to understand what they do gosh awesome and thanks for mentioning process because i think uh, enjoying the process of something is so much more important than enjoying the output i think we can all agree in that mm. um because if you don't you're just not gonna stick at it and I think one of the best examples of this is um, an exhibition that I worked on in like two years ago um, called the Dear World Project. And this was similar. So this was bringing um, neuroscientists who work on mental health together with artists of all different. So we're talking, you know, sculptors. Um, we had an amazing uh, glass sculptor, um, people who do incredible, huge installations, um, someone who does blankets and things all together for the for similar vibe. And we had different workshops where um, that had different themes and it was all around what is engagement how can we be engaging how do we work together as creatives and, and scientists and learning each other's processes and through those three workshops it was amazing to see the um, some of the scientists really coming out of themselves and actually getting a completely new perspective on their own research mm. from through someone else's eyes and this culminated in a two-week exhibition in Hackney Wick where we had everything installed in this um, amazing art gallery and invited people to come and see the works. Um, and these huge range of things, but the pro, you know, the scientists, it was great, the exhibition was great, they got to see the things in situ and people looking at them. But the resounding thing was the process, was that being able to see their work from a completely abstract angle. And it's actually meant that on a lot of my projects, right at the start, I'll bring an artist in or something right at the, or some, you know, someone who I think can give us a completely different view on something um at the at the project planning start to be like okay what are we missing what you know because we're think a lot of us think very like in the science world think very linear and like this is what we're going to do this is how we're going to get there this is our audience this is what we should do but then i need someone to be like hmm but have you thought about it like this yeah. and i think that's again why like working with so many different creatives gives that depth to the project yeah love it they do a similar thing with nasa <clears throat> so there's um there's a space program that has like a resident artist uh, who thinks about the space program from that art perspective uh, and it's given rise to some really interesting projects um, so that is awesome same in UCL they have a um, uh, one of the like, really really forefront of HIV research one of his postdocs is an artist huh. so they have an artist in residence who does you know incredible installations and things all about HIV and all about the research that they do Nice. And that's where I would love to have an artist in residence at the CVR. 
Yeah. I mean, we work, you know, we have ones that drop into projects and do little bits, but I'd love to have someone that, I mean, and Lois, I guess, kind of does fulfill that role in a lot of the creative stuff that she does in the animation and, and illustration. Um, She's a wizard, isn't she? Yeah. <laughs> You're a wizard, Lois. You're a wizard, Lois. <laughs> yeah, Lois is awesome. Um, so in, I really in, hope she's watching this. <laughs> yeah, if she's not, that'll be horrendous. Like. You're a wizard, Lois. You're a wizard. <laughs> which, which camera? Which camera? <laughs> I'll just look at all the cameras. <laughs> um, so uh, this this second section we normally like to t- talk about earning because everyone wants to know how much do you get paid? Um, but not specifically um, how much you get paid because uh, you've got a full time permanent. No, fi- as permanent. Let's work on that, people. <laughs> as permanent as it can be in in scientific research. Nice, nice. Um, yeah. So at the moment, till March twenty twenty three, um, but we are currently going through our next round of funding. Have um, another drink. Have another yeah. drink. Let's drink. Let's drink to the funding. <laughs> rounds. I have to hand in the first draft next Friday. Drink to the funding oh. rounds. How's awesome. it going so far? Great. Mm-hmm. We're gonna leave it at that. Oh. Um, okay. <laughs> so, so what? What I, what I want to ask? What I want to ask is. For creatives out there, right, when you receive uh, brand new, you know, um, when you receive an estimate or a proposal, what's your expectation in terms of what their ask is going to be in terms of the bottom dollar pound? Um, It depends on experience, what they're doing, how much commitment. And things, and you know this. I'm open to a chat about money. I'm not. I'm as which, <laughs> which I love as well because <laughs> I always am, and clients will always ask you, and then I always throw back the question: well, What budget are you working with? Yeah, and, that's, and then they'll be like, well, "How much does it cost?" I'm like, "Let's talk about it." <laughs> exactly, and I'm not one to kind of shortchange anyone. I will pay for what, like you know, I'm yeah, um, us too. And that's something that I've I really hold. I think having done a bit of freelance work myself and people really underselling me, it's something that I don't ever want to do to anyone else. And I hope that anyone that works with this really does, val- you know, try and value, really value the bottom line of what they think they're worth. So what what is that bottom line, in your opinion? You know, just generally, what are people worth, Faye? It's so hard because we have... <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a terrible question. I'm not going to force you to answer what are people worth. But I mean, you know, what what's a reasonable day rate? Christ. Um, I mean, we pay any, like, dep- again, it's like completely dependent, but we've paid anywhere between 250 to 500 pounds a day for for creatives. But but it depends on so many, like, you you reamed off a whole bunch of things at the start. Yeah. In terms of the, the value that someone is bringing. Yeah. Right. So um, how do you, how do you judge that value? I mean, that's also difficult because I, I wouldn't bring anyone on if I didn't value what they did Mm. if that makes sense so they're you know and i have had instances where people have quoted me and i've been like that's not enough you know a lot of the projects that we do we go for external funding Mm. so i can work with the creative to be like okay well what do you want me to put in the grant and that's what we've done you know with these with some of the projects we've worked on lots yeah and we put in the top worst case scenario what would your dream cost be and luckily we've had pretty much 100 percent success rate on getting stuff back because the projects that we're doing we've put so much thought into and we've worked with the right people and we've taken the time in the kind of process of writing the grants of making sure that we've got the right people that by the time we get there you know we've got the we get the top level funding Mm -hmm. um and we're able to do that and there have been a couple of occasions where i've had to be like oh we don't have much money but we really need this i'm like how much can you do for this much money so i don't ask people to lower their day rate or anything i just say okay feasibly how much can you do with this money and i'll give you as much as i can um but just be honest with me in in what you can do for that and yeah that's one thing i think i working with so many creatives and seeing how exploited some of them can be mm-hmm. um is that i just that's yeah i've got my like green list and my blacklist <laughs> Of, of people to work with and to encourage people to work with but yeah i i want yeah i don't know no, we might be rare i don't know yeah it is it is so um i guess for anyone watching it's important to know what their bottom line is in terms of i don't work for less than this um but you need that kind of negotiated wiggle room sometimes but um it's nice to know that you're not just looking for less you're looking for something different and i think that's what we do on mm. many occasions like well what can we do 
you know, and, and oftentimes part of the creative process is working out what you can do with a budget, not saying, well, you need this budget. Mm. Sometimes it's that. <laughs> just because of the nature but yeah exactly but that's then why maybe like, I've put you on to the more commercial projects because I'm like I know there you can just be like well this is how much I want you to spend on me mm. um, but I also know that like with I think with all of the creatives that we work with at the moment I am able to have that really honest conversation of being like I'm strapped this is how much I've got what, what can we do with it and most of the time they'll be like grand I'm happy to do what I can do and then yeah. we work together and then you know with a lot of our creatives they'll be costed into the next grant at the top dollar so yeah it's just that honesty and openness i think about money which is yeah it's not a very british thing to do yeah. it's but not. it needs to be yeah, yeah. i think a lot of people struggle talking about that that bottom line aspect but if you are working for yourself uh you have to you mm. have to it is yeah it's a necessity and i think also i did like last year just as a bit out of interest i worked out what you know my i know i'm salaried but worked out what i cost per day and I was like, I would never expect anyone who I'm hiring into a role because they are good at it, and so it's something I can't do, to work for less than my, what I'm being paid a day. Mm. And I think that really helped actually in working out that kind of, you know, bottom line is being like, well, no one should be expected to work less than this because I'm a professional in this role because I can do my job and I need someone because I, it's something I can't do, so they should not be paid less than me. And here, I here. Yeah, that yeah. I think you're going to have a lot of freelancers emailing you like, ah, you need some video yeah. work? <laughs> Man, let's catch up after this. Yeah. Let's catch up after this. <laughs> Recently, I saw someone talking about work-life balance. It was a post of a post. Do you know how people post people's posts and they're yeah. like, look at this idiot, mm -hmm. you know? And this idiot was talking about how young people talking about work-life balance, I mean, seriously, at your age, you should just be working because you'll need that balance later on in life when you have kids and a mortgage. And I was like, <laughs> what the hell? And everyone was just like, ripping. absolutely ripping him because it's ridiculous. You're a very busy person and you work a lot. Talk to me about that work-life balance. Um, well, for that, that idiot, I'm getting a mortgage tomorrow, so. Oh, that is exciting. <laughs> Congrats. Um, thanks. Yeah. So it's all it's all submitted. You just waiting for the big yeah, thumbs up. Big thumbs up. Nice. Keys tomorrow. Awesome. And then talking about the work life balance, I then get the keys and then I get in the car, drive four and a half hours to the Isle of Skye for a long weekend, take two days off work and leave my interns and everyone to it. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Got it sorted there. <laughs> yeah. Lois um, <laughs> Lois sorted out without you. <laughs> um no, I'm I'm really lucky and I think um yeah, this is one of the reasons I think, you know, I'd love to stay in, stay in my, like, where I am at the CVR and why I'm so lucky is because, you know, I have a lot of autonomy in my job and I'm able to run, you know, run the programme, do a lot. And my boss is absolutely phenomenal and has been so supportive and because um, I'm, I'm managed by the research manager. So I kind of don't have a public engagement person um, sitting above me at the CVR. So I do get a lot of autonomy and, and you know, the working from home as well, um, kind of being more flexible. And I work very intensely in short bursts and that's something working from home has really helped with because I feel like I kind of have the autonomy to do that mm. um, and then yeah and then I'm able to do things like yeah take a few days off go to the Isle of Skye I'm, I'm literally here there and everywhere all the time I like, like a couple of weeks ago I was down with my parents because I can work remotely and work from them and the trust yeah there's trust within the CVR that you know you can do that um, and no questions asked and I'm very, I do have a very, very good work-life balance. But you deliver um, results. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, there, you. There's trust, there's <laughs> trust there. I think, I think where a lot of people struggle is they work for a place where there isn't any trust. So yeah. their employer just innately doesn't really trust that they're going to do the right thing. And quite frankly, there's lots of people out there who aren't going to do the right thing. You know who you are. But it's a broken system because like, there's no trust system. there, so there's no trust there as well. You were so dropping, dropping some real <laughs> serious bombs Let's there. Wait till I get broken system. <laughs> Martin, tell me more about the broken system. Oh, I've got nothing to add. But what I, would, what I do want to ask is, because um, one thing I've noticed with academics and scientists, just from working with them, you know, um, comms and stuff like that is they have a lot of annual leave like what, how many holidays do they get in a year <laughs> a lot um yeah, like, well we work for a lot of us work for universities so we're very lucky that we get a lot of shutdown days so like over christmas like we wouldn't be we wouldn't be working between christmas and new year unless it's what 
yeah but then i don't know i don't know about that because we they do but a lot of them like for example at the end of march any annual leave that you've had carried over you have to like use by the end of march and there'll be no one at the center because yeah. no one's used it and a lot of academic like they, we get a lot of annual leave but it's they don't use it i do <laughs> yeah. um but and a lot of people as well like will take off a lot of the summer holidays with kids and things like that so yeah but i mean i get something ridiculous like 43 days including all the bank holidays um yeah it's amazing um, um, what's annual leave <laughs> Sorry, freelancer. Can I like leave annually? Is that it? Can I just like get the <laughs> for a day? Get the f out of Dodge. Like, <laughs> good. I'm out of here, guys. Sorry, I'm on annual leave as a freelancer. Ooh. That's a new one. Yeah. That's a new one. Come over to I mean, the dark side. I'm not. You've already got an office with us, haven't you? Mate? Yeah, that's true. Satellite <laughs> office. Yeah, yeah. You spend so much time with us that <laughs> no, might as well. Might sense. as well. Might as well. But yeah, yeah. Some sort of job share. I could do some sciencing. Could do some pipetting. pipetting yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Snap. <laughs> this is how long we've been working together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> long enough. Long enough. Long enough. Um, so, what's what's it like um, in the CDR then? Because luckily, people can go and check out a lot more content than they used to mm. in terms of exploring your work. There's probably more interest in centers that research viruses and stuff mm -hmm. than ever. What's it like behind closed doors? What are you carrying? And I don't, I don't mean knives. <laughs> well, me personally, or the, the researchers in their lab coats with their pipettes. With their pipettes. Um, <laughs> Why are the lab coats always creased? Uh, Who's not doing the ironing around that place? That would be me, probably. <laughs> um, we have actually discussed with Massimo recently, our director, about getting a steamer for them on the public engagement yes, budget. please. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> I'm thinking about shoot. bringing a steamer because... <laughs> You it's know. getting a bit ridiculous, isn't it? But at least the next time you're with us, you're going into our high containment unit, so you'll be in the full hazmat shaboodle. Yeah, yeah. Proper. Yeah. Proper. Uh-huh. Yeah. I'm going to be looking suave, suave, suave. <laughs> Which camera? Suave. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Awesome. Um, but yeah, the CVS, um, it's it's difficult because you've got you know you've got the labs and that's where you, literally all of the things that you imagine that happen in a lab happen in those labs lots of pivoting lots of creased lab coats um and then you know all the academics well everyone has their own desk which is like a desk that you would like assume that everyone has um <laughs> i have a an office that doesn't have any light which is basically exactly like what you would expect a scientist to come out of <laughs> just out of the dark like um yeah I don't know what yeah that's yeah. that's <laughs> summary yeah. Yeah, you've really painted a picture of well okay oh. if you want to if you want me to give the, the creative answer about what the what it's like to be at the yes, CVR yes, is walking down that <laughs> shall I do it to camera yeah. um walking down the road and suddenly what appears in front of you is a giant gold box that looks like it is out of something from Austin Powers gold member um sounds rude <laughs> Well, have you watched Austin Powers Gold Member? Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. Um, but it is like that strange Dutch man in Gold Member has created a building for himself. And that is what the CVR looks like. Um, <coughs> Perfect. Uh, <laughs> and cut. <laughs> Shall I finish the there? Um, no, it's just a big building, uh, lots of glass, and full of lots of wonderful people doing incredible things. Yeah. Um, really welcoming people yeah. as well. Everyone's uh, like keen to chat. I know everyone's super busy, but every time we pop in, they either run because they see the camera, or they're <laughs> you know, like, "Oh, hey, how's it going?" Which yeah. is quite nice. I yeah. think I think actually, like someone said yesterday, that they said it's one of the best places they've ever worked for that culture and like the people, yeah. um, just being really friendly. And that's something that when I went for my interview, is even their video content that they had before that was all about the history of the CVR and things. You just wanted to work there, yeah. and it was you know things of their like their Christmas um, parties and all of them dressing up and things. It just seemed like a really friendly collegiate place to work. And I was like, I want to work there. And all of the, you know, all of my team have been um, remote the whole time. Like Lois has come up a handful of times, mainly to work with both of you. Yeah. And, um, but there's still that sense of everyone knows each other. Everyone's really friendly. And that's what I think has made my job a lot easier in terms of being like with engagement is that people are happy to chat to me and that's quite rare in engagement you get a lot of academics who are very anti 
that for, for many reasons and main, m most of it is workload and not prioritizing it but I think we've got yeah I think it is a really nice place when you walk in you're like you're, everyone will say hello to you and everyone's really welcoming and wondering what you're doing. Talk to me about <clears throat> the future of what you do and science communication so especially given technology changes mm -hmm. and social networks and you know meta you know, heard heard of meta have you heard of meta i'm too N old nfts <laughs> heard of an nft talk to me about how technology <laughs> just 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 name dropping i'm just name dropping talk to me about how technology is changing what you're doing um you know social networks you know engagement mm -hmm. um content types of content mm -hmm. What's happening? What are we looking forward to? Whew, a lot. Um, I think the last two years have basically completely revolutionised like public engagement science communication as a whole sector because mm. it's run off in person events and you know going to science festivals and going into communities and running events in you know in those spaces which we just weren't able to do and you know. I've literally got off a call earlier today where we were reviewing um, an article that had been put out all about how Twitter has changed science communication and whether it will stay like that and should it stay like that? Mm. Are there things that we can learn? Are there things that we should change? But yeah, I mean, we all kind of have heard about the infodemic and all of the, you know, the content that's been put out and, you know, the CVR before the kind of you know this they had um the contagious thinking blog which was a kind of blog podcast um some videos um but it was a very much a kind of sideline of 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 the cvr and since you know 2020 that has just completely changed you know our our digital content is something we've really focused on and it's the same with the whole sector like our whole sector had to move online we had to start hosting schools events online having to you know do loads of stuff like that all online and the all of the conferences that we've all been at talking about this has been like should we stay this way is this is this the new way of engaging and doing mm. science communication should we be doing hybrid events and trying to have half in person half digital should everything go back to how it was before or, and what can we learn from the shift and i think for me the most amazing thing about it was how all of the public engagement science communication professionals who aren't necessarily creatives have all had to learn to be creatives hmm. in that space you know i had to learn how to do online facilitation i had to learn how to create all of these online <laughs> like resources um and i'm again i'm very lucky being at a virus research center with resource during that time when we could get people like lois who know that craft and know how to do that but otherwise yeah like any of the kind of other public engagement science communication professionals have all had to learn how to use the adobe suites and also to, to do all this content if they didn't have that resourcing um so i think for for our sector especially we've now got a whole load of completely different skilled you know people who, who were brilliant at doing the the in-person festivals and getting that light bulb moments from kids with you know hands-on activities who now have a whole suite of other skills because because of that and i think for us you know we've got a lot of researchers who have quite the following on twitter for example mm. um especially some of our researchers who work on kind of the evolution of sars-cov-2 and you know kind of trying to stop the lab leak theory and things like that but we've got people mm. and that's something we don't <coughs> want to no we're not going to talk about that. you can't <laughs> drop the lab leak <laughs> theory. theory oh wait i get it i get it <laughs> it didn't come from a lab no it didn't came from the environment yep. you know who you are yeah <laughs> but i think yeah <laughs> we now have a platform we didn't have before mm. because of that so it's something that i mean there are, it, we're quite divided in the field of people who want to go back to on you know in person and they're like you absolutely cannot create meaningful engagement online which i was in that camp but I think the last year and all of the, like throwing ourselves into the digital content and seeing how engaged people have been with it, I've changed my mind. Yeah, <coughs> I, think. I, I would say it doesn't necessarily replace. No, uh, but it can support and facilitate that across the years. You know, because how many kids never? I don't think I ever went to any science event. Like this is the nineties which was very lacking in science. Um, but yeah, I don't remember going to any specific science events. Um, and I'm sure lots of young people, especially in deprived areas, don't have the opportunity to 
whereas although arguably lots of deprived families don't have ready access to internet and devices as well so there's another challenge so there's always going to be a place for in-person events and they're fun you know interacting with people yeah. like we are now this is the first like live martin and i have never done cut to together in person it's the always been met. remote <laughs> <laughs> he looks weird in real life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's like 3D and everything. He's a real. He's a real boy. Yeah. <laughs> do you think um, with the whole like I'm going to talk about COVID? But do you think um, like especially on Twitter? Do you think like engagement in science in general is just like exploded because of like the the whole COVID thing? Yeah, um, it's a really interesting one because you know we go into things now where we're talking about viruses and and stuff any event and there's this new level of assumed knowledge that we that people didn't have before yeah. you know people know what rna is and you know things and have more understanding about vaccines and understand more about science than they ever have before so we <laughs> what's that? just interacting with the folks at home <laughs> um and that's really a really good place to be i think now is especially working on viruses is that we we kind of can yeah we've got a more engaged audience but i think again like things like twitter it's come you know it's good that there are a lot more people engaging a lot more but also then there are a lot of people making very bad assumptions yeah. and and that as well so <sighs> say it say the word what fake, fake, fake news. news fake yeah. news <laughs> yes fake news and that's what we have to come up against, right? And like Lois and I have, when we've put things out about certain papers or things that have come out, we have been sat there ready mm. <laughs> for the for the fake newsers. Um, and luckily, actually, we haven't. I think because we're sat behind a an organisation rather than it being a person, yeah, we don't get no that. Attack. Yeah, there's no one to attack, so we don't get it. But yeah, some of our researchers have. Um, mm. But I think overall, it hasn't ever stopped any of our researchers carrying on with their online presence and mm. things at all, which has been really good. good. So I think long term, it is something, you know, going into our next funding renewal, you know, we are going to stay on this digital communications platform. It's something that we really want to build on because it has been so successful for us. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So opportunities for creatives out there who have an interest in science or no interests and are just interested in getting paid <laughs> and also but we are going to be at in-person events this year as well um like we'll be at glasgow science festival awesome um fourth and fifth of june at mug dot country park we're going to do a nice. kind of satellite event up there um working with the conservation volunteers who are going to be doing some little citizen sciencey things um and then on the i think 9th and 10th of june we'll be at the glasgow botanic gardens um with some virusy fun um <laughs> So yeah, we're where good. you can get your own virus. <laughs> yeah, virus and fun in the same. <laughs> <laughs> hey, our mug dot one is going to be a little scavenger hunt for so viruses or ticks. Oh. Even better, oh. ticks. <laughs> Not I remember, real ones. I remember getting a tick in in Scotland, and uh, everyone was freaking out. And I was like, it's only a tick. Did you report it to our tick map? I didn't even <laughs> know there was a tick map. We have created a tick map where you can report your sightings or bitings of really? ticks across Scotland. Yeah. Oh, wow. That is great. Any any other maps people should know about? <laughs> uh, not at the moment, but one of our PhD students, Spiros, is actually the absolute king of creating maps of, of like viruses and where awesome. they come from and where they go. So, yeah. Are there any really interesting or rewarding projects that you're working on just now that the world should know about? The world meaning our audience of four, <laughs> five. Hey, Lois. If we're including my mum, that's six. And Lois, yeah. Yep. Thanks, Lois. Um, <laughs> Lois increasing our numbers by like 20%. <laughs> so I think one of my absolute joy projects, and this is one that we're going to um, kind of culminate this summer, um, which you've both been working on, um, is our project called Unseen Hands. And this came from um, a group of people who live with the bloodborne virus. So this um, mainly HIV, um, but also hepatitis C. And we went to them with a pot of money and said, look, we've got this money and we'd love to do something with you. What can we do? And they were all, and this was, you know, the charity, but also the, the service users. Mm. And they said, we're really interested in the journey of a blood sample. You know, once it comes out of my arm, what happens mm. in scientific research? And we have a complete, you know, a set of researchers who work on so many different things, as you both know, from the eight or nine kind of videos that we're doing, um, who all look at completely different things from that blood sample. And we thought, actually, 
this is quite a good like, set of stories that we can tell. Um, and to do that and to tell the stories, we needed to actually put the researchers and the patients, well, not patients, but the people living with HIV and hepatitis in the same room. And we did this virtually because there's so much kind of disconnect between them. So fundamental virologists, the ones that work in the lab in Petri dishes, will ne you know, won't ever really see someone who lives with the virus. That's the clinicians. Um, but they're in the lab every day working with the virus. And in our next fund set of funding, we want to have more of a clinical platform for our work. We want to be doing more with our clinicians and that translation between what happens in the Petri dish to clinic and to the patient. And that's a big step for people who've never had interaction with, pat with patient groups and people living with the viruses that we study. So we thought, OK, how do we bridge this gap? And we thought there's many things that, that, um, that need to be talked about first. Language because the two different groups have completely different language. And we ran a session on that where we brought them all together and we're like, what are the words, you know, ask the researchers, what are the words that you use in your everyday life to describe your research? And then ask the, the group of people living with the virus, what are the words that you find really stigmatizing? Hmm. And the overlap between the two was quite amazing. Words like infected, People living with hepatitis, HIV, do not like to be, you know, do not like that word. It holds a lot of stigma. Whereas the researchers are just like, well, I work with infected cells, you know, and it was all those nuances about kind of, comp so that was what amazing conversation that, that we had with a lot of our kind of people living with viruses and our researchers to have those conversations. We came up with a common glossary, words not to use, words we can use depending on the context. Um, we shared resources and we came up with kind of words of the day, things that we kind of sat down together and were like that, this is what this relationship means. And then from that, and, and before that, we worked with Alice, the artist, to do the journey of a blood sample. And this was bringing the researchers and the um, the people living with the viruses together um, to explore the journey of a blood sample through a imaginary art gallery and Alice took us through the journey from literally it being taken from your arm through to the courier coming to collect it and drop it off through to the petri dish and how every person in that room would display that in an art gallery and some of the things were amazing like the journey some one of the um, the guys said that the journey of a blood sample was like a ghost train you never know what's around the next corner as someone living with HIV um, and then there was like, yeah, it was it was amazing. But it just again it opened those conversations. But for me to answer your question, the one that is that I think it, like the, the reason this project is so kind of my like love it is one of our um, they call, we call them peers because we kind of trying to make sure that everyone feels on the same level. That whether you're a scientist, whether because we call the people living with the virus, they're experts by experience. Um, and one of them said that we all live with HIV, whether it's we go to work and we work with it in cells in a Petri dish, we live with it. Mm. And whether we get up every day and take a pill that, you know, and we live with the virus. And she, you know, she said at the end of the day, we all might go and get on the same bus and go home and watch Corrie. But we've all lived with the virus that day. And that is that moment where the researchers were like, whoa, that, that and it brought that level playing field of them all being on the same kind of the same page and that's that is what like why I do my job that is the and yeah we've got a so our next stage of that project obviously our, so we're telling the stories of the researchers which are for and we've done that in kind of co-production with the the peer group to make sure that the information is is what they want and then also on the 1st of June we're finally all going to get together in person and do a big artistic workshop because um, from those workshops we realised that everyone felt like a piece of the puzzle in, in our research and so we've decided to do a big art um, workshop where everyone can design a puzzle piece that represents their part of you know, research, like bloodborne virus research as a whole and that will be installed at the centre. Nice. And then hopefully in September we will tour that to this building. Um, during the so this building is going to be launched in a festival in September, and we're hoping to tour it here and invite the peers um, and the charities and everyone who's been involved to here to see it, um, to see the kind of embodiment of that project and and everyone's piece of the puzzle, basically. Great work. So yeah, yeah. that's that project. <laughs> super exciting. Yeah. Yeah, I've really enjoyed working on that project as well. It's been super insightful. Um, especially that overlap um, in terms of language. So language is powerful um, and uh, can disconnect people but also bring them together. Um, so that's really awesome. Absolutely. Good work. Good work. Well, any final 
points that you'd like to make. Anything you think we've missed before we I don't it think up, so. Do a final cut to <laughs> I don't think so. Well, perhaps yeah. this is an opportunity for me to say that this podcast is supported by absolutely ruddy <laughs> nobody. <laughs> And so if you'd like to help support this podcast, simply tell a friend or an enemy. It's up to you, but tell someone, tell someone. You can do the regular things, right, Martin? Like, subscribe, share, yada, yada, yada. Hit that bell button. You know the, you know the thing. Um, but finally, Faith, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks yeah. for helping us set up this awesome <laughs> location. Jake's in the corner, absolute <laughs> legends. <laughs> Thank you so much. His voice. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we have a final cheers? Yep. Yeah. And also Sandra. to say thank you, Lois, for watching. <laughs> Thanks, Mum. Yep. <laughs> My mum's definitely not watching, though. Definitely. Cheers. Cut, 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 c